Welcome viewers to this 22nd episode of Beyond Phrenology. Uh, we are extremely delighted today to have with us Professor William Warren. Professor William Warren, as you all might know, is a full professor of uh, cognitive sciences at Brown University. Uh, and he is a very eminent figure in the field of ecological psychology uh, or non-representational sciences in general. Uh, Professor William Warren, you also received the Ken Nakayama uh, medal for excellence in vision sciences this year from the Society for Vision. Uh, so that's a great news. Uh, and Professor Warren, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Mother. So Professor Warren, we have been, uh, I mean, the first thing you do when you start reading ecological psychology is read your 1984 article, the chair climbing article. Right? Ah, that's the uh, first thing? I, that's that's embarrassing. But I yeah, mean, okay. <laughs> uh, after, after Gibson. Mm. So, but 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 that's one of the most popular articles uh, you published, right? Uh, it's still my most. It's still my most cited paper. That was my dissertation work, and it's you know I haven't surpassed that since. So that's right. it. Right. But it is an eye opener in the sense that uh, you know you you hear these talks about affordances, and there's probably no other study uh, dating back uh, that makes affordance so intuitive, uh, in especially in terms of relating the body to the environment. So we'll, we'll come to the study later, but uh, would you like to elaborate a little on how you started your career and, uh, you know, became an ecological psychologist and you are where you are right now? Yeah, that'd be, that's fine. So I, um, I started out, out life as a, as a Piagetian. Um, I remember going to, so I went to um, Hampshire College in Massachusetts, which was an experimental college, still is an experimental college that really had assembled the disciplines that became cognitive science in the in 1970, right? In uh, one school, it was called the School of Language and Communications, but it had all those disciplines that then became cognitive science. Um, and so I was taking a class um, on developmental psychology and it suddenly dawned on me that you could study, you know, mental life, right? The mind in as, as a science. I mean, in the same way that you could study physics, which I'd had an interest in, an interest in, or biology, which I had an interest in, you could study the mind in the same way. And so that was kind of a, a bit of a revelation. And I started, you know, kind of taking other courses connected to the, that problem. Um, and I did, took a course um, with Peter Pufall, who was teaching at Smith, um, who was a follower of, of Gibson. And um, Peter said, you should go do your junior year abroad in Minnesota with Bob Shaw. And I said, okay, I can go do that. Um, so I contacted Shaw. Shaw was at the Center for Advanced Study at Stanford that year. So I, but I went to Minnesota anyway and worked with um, Herb Pick who, and Al Jonas, who were both students from Cornell who had worked with Gibson. And um, I, during that year, I heard Gibson give a lecture. So this is, you know, shortly, a couple years before Gibson's death. And Gibson came and gave a lecture at the University of Minnesota, where he talked about how um, memory is not required to perceive events. And I remember getting on my bicycle and riding back home after that lecture, <clears throat> thinking, this is crap. This is this can't be true. This is ridiculous. Yeah. By the time I got back to my my room, I had decided to do my senior project on exactly that problem. And so I went back um, to Hampshire and at that time, I, my advisor became a guy named uh, Jim Coplin, who had been Bob Shaw's advisor as a graduate student at Vanderbilt. And Coplin had, had left Vanderbilt and become one of the founding faculty at Hampshire. And so Coplin gave me uh, Gibson to read. And so I read, I read through Gibson and it was a kind of conversion experience, right? It's like, you know, oh, we don't need to hit, invoke all of these crazy principles that you know, that, that I'd been reading in, yeah. in both in psychology and cognitive, or the early cognitive science work at that time. Um, you don't need to invoke all this stuff. Like there's information, you know, this is a possible explanation and you don't need to, you know, perceive the world into a series of snapshots and store the snapshots and pull them out of memory and compare them to the next snapshot. And it was just, it just kind of like was so elegant and simple that it was, it kind of instantly won me over. So I did my senior project on, uh, on that problem of how, um, how you perceive events over time without invoking memory. And that became my first publication, actually. So I also at Minnesota heard Michael Turvey come and give a talk. Um, 
I went back to Minnesota after I graduated and worked as an RA for a year. And Turvey came and gave a talk about how light gets into a muscle. And I said, that's the problem, right? That's what perception is all about, right? It's about action. It's not about sitting in the, as Gibson would say, the theater of consciousness observing the world, right? It's yeah. about interacting with the world and being embedded in the world. Um, and so Copland uh, put me in touch with Bob Shaw, who had just moved to the University of Connecticut. Turvey was at the University of Connecticut. Um, I talked to Shaw about my honors thesis when I was working on it. So I was kind of embedded in this community. Um, and at Minnesota, Jim Jenkins um, was very influential um, in you know, the, the early work on generative language um, and bringing that into psychology. And he also said, you know, you should go work with Shaw. <laughs> and so I did. So I, I that's where I went to graduate school. Okay. And since then, after that, uh, since then, you have been at Brown. Yeah, since finishing um, my, my degree, I've basically been at Brown. Um, and this is like a, a piece of advice for other younger people. Um, you know, so I've been at Brown my entire career. But on every sabbatical, I've gone away, right? I've gone somewhere else. Yeah. And I think without that, I would not still be at the, the place that I started. Um, but that's a way of getting an infusion of new ideas and new new right. ones. Which is very important, yes. Right. I mean, of course, I mean, given how much you uh, you were traveling during your undergrad years, perhaps uh, when you when you look at that, you have been involved and, you know, throughout your career, it feels a little less travel unless you know that you have been traveling uh, in during your sabbaticals. Yeah. So, so Professor Brown, uh, what was it like when you started? Like, how popular was uh, EcoPsych then? Because now we know that there are several hotspots of EcoPsych in the US uh, and in Europe. Uh, but that has been much recent. I would say, like, it has grown in the last two decades a lot more. Yeah. Uh, how was it during your time? Because Gibson was just starting with his work, and a lot of people thought that. Uh, it was unbelievable for, for the most part, for the most of neuroscience community. So how yeah, easy was, was it for you and uh, how popular the things were? Yeah, so Gibson, I mean, Gibson had been working since 19, you know, his work in the in World War II, right? Yeah. And so his last book was published in 1979, just after I started graduate school at UConn. And um, it was clearly a minority school, right, of thought. And people literally thought Gibson was crazy saying the word affordances in public was like, sub, you know, submitted, subjected you to, to public shaming. Um, so it was, it was really um, a lot of these ideas, direct perception, you know, information in, in the, in the visual scene, um, affordances, they were all kind of persona non grata in the, in the field of public. Um, and so, but at UConn, they were really pushing the boundaries of this, right? So there were a couple of places at that point Clearly, Cornell was still active. Um, Ulrich Neisser had been persuaded by many of Gibson's arguments, and his conversion book came out also while I was uh, a graduate student at um, at UConn. Um, and you know, so it, it, you had the feeling that there was kind of creeping influence, right, was yeah. going on, but it was really um, outside. It was it was an outsider point of view. So, Professor Warren, you your work uh, basically revolves around at least uh, the recent work, visual control of action, right, and locomotion and navigation. So, uh, could you like to uh, would you like to tell a little bit about like uh, you know how the gravitas of the word visual control and, and how it delineates from uh, from the representational or or mainstream uh, you know kind of visual control uh, of uh, movement. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a big topic to take on as a whole. Uh, yeah. So maybe, maybe what I'll do is what I'll say is, um, I mean, there were key, there were kind of key influences in this idea, and one was certainly the work of David Lee. Yeah. Um, so, so David had done really primary research on trying to, you know, apply mathematics to optical information and characterize things like optic flow and time to contact variables and so on and then did behavioral experiments to try to sh to try to see how those variables actually influenced you know real behavior um and so i think you know at uconn there was there was kind of two two threads one was a very very theoretical thread which um and there were many many discussions and we were all reading interdisciplinary work 
you know, from everything from computer science to philosophy to yeah. you know, biology, physics, and so on. Um, but it was very abstract, right? And then the other thread was, how do we do experiments on this stuff, right? Because right. right. we've got all these ideas. And I think one of the things that kind of paralyzed the, the early ecological approach was that the, the ideas sounded good, but how the heck do you do ex an experiment if you can't sit a subject down and flash you know, an image on a tachistoscope in their eyes, right? How do you do research? Like, what? how do you study real behavior? And David Lee had made real progress, right, with that and trying to create, you know, the, like the swinging room environment, right, where you could manipulate the optic flow to a person who is actually standing or walking in a swinging room. Right. Um, and so that was, that was an inspiration. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I read a book by Jean-Paul Sartre called Search for a Method. And... That was I can kind of describe my my graduate school experience as a search for my method, right? And it quickly became clear to me that I needed experimental data, right? It's fine. I could sit there and generate ideas, right? And or read, you know, really fascinating abstract ideas, but without making them concrete and and being able to test them, I had no idea what to believe. So yeah, that sounded good. Or some other yeah. ideas sound good. It's logically consistent. Or it's illogically illogical, but it's like, you know, without, but what, where's the beef, right? What's the, what, how do we find out which of these ideas is really, really pans out? And so pretty quickly, I realized I was tied to experimental data and experimental work. And that was the way that, that I was going to be able to move forward. And I, so, yeah. so that's the, so the visual control, you know, that whole program is really was first trying to solve the problem of how do you study this? Right, right. right. Um, experimentally. And David did that often by observational studies. So he observed, you know, people doing somersaults and hummingbirds, you know, yeah. uh, or, you know, or the dive, famous diving gannet paper. So and, and that is allows you to to form to find correlations, right, to find patterns that are consistent with your theories. Yes. To test the theories, you really have to go do an experimental intervention. You got to manipulate the information somehow. And right. so we were all trying to figure out how do you do that right. in a realistic way. And this directly speaks to the problem uh, or, or a challenge that science generally faces that there are a lot of ideas which are innovative, uh, which are pushing the boundaries. But a lot of time we do not have the proper methods or, or proper way to actually experimental manipulate variables to, uh, to kind of support the theories. Yeah, uh, and one of the paradigm shift happens when uh, when you are able to break that wall of uh, experimentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think we find that this all the time in, I mean, in various kind of complex systems approaches to you know to you know behavior in neuroscience. It's like you can make these measurements, right? But how do you like intervene somehow and test whether the things you're measuring actually play some sort of functional role in the behavior or the psychology that we're uh, interested in? Right, right. Uh, it, it, it's everywhere. I mean, we talk about endpoint control, for instance, in movement science. Like, is it actually an endpoint control for the brain or or for for cognition, or it's just endpoint for us? Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So, so going uh, back, going back to the yeah. question of representation, I, mean, I think the yeah. the what seemed what just seems obvious to me is if you can have a more parsimonious theory, yeah. it's a better theory, right? So if you right. don't you invoke representations, like if you if you can control behavior or explain the control of behavior based on sufficient optical information that's available to you now, yes. right? You don't need to invoke all of this other apparatus of representations and memories and internal models because you're just coupled to the world in this immediate moment in a way that allows the behavior to be successful. So it's it's uh, it's just, it seems to me superfluous. To, uh, I, I, I agree with you and, and it's a, uh... It's a more concise and you can say uh, informationally more efficient version to describe a phenomena as well, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's much more elaborative with much less uh, uh, explanatory variables. But there, but there are two, I, I, I'll play devil's advocate here. You know, I'm your, on your side here, but there are two criticisms. One is, one can argue that Gibson wrote a book called The, the, the Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. Uh, and then a lot of your work is in vision. And when we look at the field of ecological psychology in general, uh, a lot of has a lot of it has remained at the level of optic flow and and visual control. Some in haptic perception, but mostly in visual. Uh, 
and uh, much less in in the domain of auditory or for instance uh, smell and uh, other modalities so one can argue that what you are looking at and what you are seeing as an evidence of direct perception is nothing but a small blip like uh, uh, an exception to the rule of representation and there are some things outside in the world that's all you are able to tap and that is not generalizable to everything that the brain does mm -hmm. so how do we counter a criticism like that well i you know i accept the criticism that that my work and and much work on perception is is visual centric right um, but that's changing, and I think it's changed over the years. Um, so there, there is work on on audit. So a lot of work on event perception, right? Yeah. Is multimodal. There's increasing work on multimodal perception. Um, you know that includes auditory information and haptic information and proprioceptive information. Um, and I think th I think that's great, right? I mean, I I have done some of that work myself. Um, so that just means more information is available, right? In my yeah. view, um, and there are there are interesting questions about, you know, is the information in all of those different modalities um, consistent with it? With you know, if you give the right description to, for example, auditory tau and visual tau, at the abstract level, it's the same information, even though it's realized in different, yes. you know, physical um, right. arrays, energy arrays. So there's there's a, there are interesting questions there about, you know, can you identify similar common variables across um, different uh, energy arrays, but there are going to be different. There are differences as well, and, and one of my favorite examples is is the electric fish, right? So the uh, weekly electric fish has I, has developed systems, evolved systems that use um, electrical fields, right? That sense yeah. electric fields and use information in electric fields, and solve the same problems that we solve through visual information um, with different variables. Right, but nonetheless, can actually solve those those similar problems about perceiving where things are and what their shapes are, and so on. So, you know, I think there's just a plethora of information. So, uh, so in that sense, EcoSight provides a more abstract or more modality independent and species independent or more you can say evolutionary grounded explanation of cognition. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's it's species independent, and this is one of my pet peeves that I, I do think. So you mentioned Gibson's 79 book, which focused on vision, yeah. where his 1966 book was really focused on, on many perceptual systems. Um, but from his first book in 1950, where he kind of assumed along with everybody else that we're recovering you know, the physical world, yeah. um, a Newtonian description, right? a Euclidean description of the geometry of the world, and by the time he gets to 1979, he's beginning, he's questioning that assumption, right? And he actually makes statements in that book where I'd, I'd made the mistake of, of believing that you could perceive the local slant of every point in the, in the environment and our perception of shape would be compounded of all these little local slants. That's a Euclidean concept, right? Yeah. And then he calls it a mistake. But what there is, is like convexities and concavities that are kind of unitary features of the layout. And that's a topological conception of what the structure of the world is. Right. <clears throat> and so he, he he kind of moved away from this, I think one of the assumptions that has tangled up perception ever since at least Descartes, right, is that we're we're trying to recover, we're geometers, right? We're trying to recover the Euclidean geometry of the scene. And Gibson began to, to turn to that and say, well, look, there's some things we can perceive reliably, and we need to study the information for that. Right. And it's there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to perceive you now Euclidean shape. We're going to perceive something more, maybe more behaviorally relevant, like qualitative shape, convexities and concavities. And so you, you once you try to like describe the objects of perception and describe the information for the things that we actually perceive, you yeah. can get this sort of seamless mapping, right? Um, from these properties of the environment and these properties of of visual information and the properties of our perceptual awareness. Um, and Joe Lappin talks about that as, as kind of a structural correspondence that spans these different domains, but, but ties our perception together. Right. I think a lot of this you discuss in your 2006 article, if I'm correct, uh, right? The perception action paper. Uh, yeah, less, uh, less so there than in some later papers, but... Um, but yeah, it's 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 really a question of what are the objects, you know, what are the objects of perception that we should be studying instead yeah. of saying 
we should be able to perceive, you know, the cylindrical shape of this object where we don't, okay? Um, but there is information for what we do perceive. And that's the critical kind of Gibsonian insight. So so how does a, I mean, it's, it's challenging, right? I mean, if let's say I'm a graduate student and I don't want to expand on one of the paradigms already established in EcoPsych and I want to identify a new problem and start a research program from scratch. So how do I identify a, an ecological <laughs> problem? Yeah. Go I, along? I think, yeah. I mean, I think the problem is there's no shortage of these problems, right? It's like pick any behavior and try to figure out how it's done. Um, you know, there's been, you know, in the, in the, I don't know, last, know, probably the nineties, there's a big upsurge of interest in, in, uh, sports, right. And partially that's due to the complications of motor control, right. In highly skilled performance, but it's also the fact that we're, we're using information, you know, fluidly at high rates of speed, doing all of these complicated tasks. So when you're playing a, you know, a sport, you're coupled to your environment in this immediate way that requires high levels of performance. And, you know, so there was an interest in saying, well, how do we do those things, right? right. And that led people to, to identify different kinds of information and to identify how information is coupled together with aspects of, of motor behavior. Um, the problem is, and this is, this is one of my big worries, analyzing information is really hard. Right. It and it requires good mathematics. It requires understanding of physics, optics, acoustics, and so on. And it's you can spend a lot of time bashing your head against a wall trying to figure out what are these variables, because our, you know, our kind of ordinary mathematics might not be sufficient to get us there. No. Yeah. Right. And so one of my first sabbatical actually was with in the lab of Jan Kunderink who was a physicist who had turned his attention to, um, to vision. And he had the mathematical skills and he had the physical you know, insights and knowledge to kind of identify these very abstract and variant properties of you know, uh, shading fields and motion fields um, and disparity fields, right? And that really moved the ball forward, right? And so as someone starting out, it's like, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say you have to be like Jan Kunderink. And that's a, that's a very tall order. Um, but that's where we need, I mean, that's where we need, prog one of the places we need progress to be made. Right. And in that sense, Yukon was unique, right? In terms of, I mean, I, I, I never studied there, but from people I know who were trained at Yukon, uh, they read a lot. I mean, even the papers which came out of the group and, uh, and the kind of writing habits of Yukon trained uh, researchers have they cite things from all over the place right from physics to biology to computer science uh psychology economics uh yeah. very very different than most graduate training which is more like uh, uh restricted to a particular subject yeah now the reading lists for both um bob shaw's and michael turvey's courses kept growing right so yeah. year by year right the reading list would be impossible um but we were kind of expected to know right all those domains and to have read the classic literature right that was being yeah. criticized as well as you know all this weird stuff from self-organizing systems um so yeah it was it's a tall order but those habits are really really important one of the things that i learned from shaw is um you you find the the math mathematics or you find the description that's appropriate for your problem, right? Don't go in assuming that there's going to be some general description, right? right? You have to find the description that's appropriate for your problem. And then you might be able to, you know, find these correspondences and make progress on that problem. Um, anything goes, right? Any source of information might be, might give you insight, right? Into solving those problems. And Turvey was the same way. So Turvey's reading list included, you know, all the all different disciplines, but around a theme, right? About trying to understand how structure uh, emerges in all of these different domains. Right. So, so uh, there has been a trend lately. So, some fields, for instance, a lot of cognitive neuroscience, uh, motor control, uh, they have gone to finding these universal concepts which can explain almost anything. So, mm -hmm. for instance, and for instance, neuroscience went into uh, objects like mirror neurons at some point. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we also have a book called The Myth of Mirror Neurons by Greg Hickok, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Completely dismantling the idea of mirror neurons, although we still have the proponents of the concept. Mm 
Yeah. Likewise, in motor control, we have ideas like internal model, which can uh, almost which can explain almost every behavior uh, at at least at the algorithmic level. But and optimal, now optimal control theory. I mean, I think uh, optimal, optimal control, yeah, optimal motor control theory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and along with that, we have now neurophysiological work showing correlates of optimal control in the cerebellum, for instance. And a lot of work is focused on cerebellum, which produces much more structured signals compared to other regions of the brain. Uh, in cognitive science, we have concepts like fear and G principle now, which is supposed to explain every everything. Uh, so there's a, like this hunt of universal principles, which is very orthogonal to how you describe how we go along with ecological psychology, where we identify information and we have to come up with a with a mathematical construct or with the uh, you know with a framework which is apply which can be applied to that to understanding that problem or or, or the informational uh, exchange. So how do you reconcile these two approaches where EcoPsych is going towards diversifying, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the concepts and other fields are, even though they have wide variety of tools, they're trying to converge in terms of the concepts. Yes, yeah, so I wouldn't agree with the, that characterization of ecological psychology. I mean, I think at the same time, you know, there's some kind of general principles or general insights that are guiding yeah. <laughs> our search yeah. for information and our understanding of, of problems like visual control or or self-organization in motor systems. Um, and we're, we're, we're searching for those general principles or general laws that are going to cut across domains. Um, but at the same time, right, so, and part of this is a, is a matter of, of, um, you know, tactics. It's like, do you start, so there was a strong sense at UConn that we have to kind of start at the top and first reinvent physics, right? So we have to reinvent physics in a way that can account for self-organization in biology, right? And that's gonna alter physics. Yeah. So we have to go, you know, go back to quantum mechanics. We have to go back to, you know, um, field theory and reconceive all of that so we could derive, right, the, the, biological and mathematical and the psychological principles that we're studying. And my my I just don't I just don't have that capacity, right? So my capacity is to start kind of bottom up and say, we need a research program. We need to we need to collect data. We need to find do experiments that are going to sort out these ideas and we'll hopefully with converging ultimately on more general principles. And I think both are are part of the enterprise, right? Um, and I'm glad we have people working from both ends, right? Toward toward trying to find both specific explanations of behavior, right? That are also consistent with and driven by more more general principles. So I mean, we don't even know what a law is. We don't even know how to no. write a law, right? Yeah. In our in our field, and yeah. you know, and it has something to do with invariances across these domains, right? Of environment, information, and behavior experience. Right, so there, there's some sort of you know conservation invariance principles that are going to have to span these different domains. So we kind of know that much, right? But we don't even yeah. know how to formalize these things at the abstract level. Right, and how to how to basically uh, in quotes represent them right on paper. Yeah, yeah. So what a what a mathematical description, right, would, would look like. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So I mean, so do you do you... have the adequate mathematics, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, that adequate tools and even concepts, right, to span these different domains. We can argue that. We can also argue whether there can be analytical solutions or it has to be numerically driven. I mean, we can, right, there might be oh, yeah, no analytical true. solution, right? Yeah, and that's that's a kind of a complex systems uh, moral, right? Right, right, right. There's no analytical solution. It has to be numerical. Yeah. yeah. So do you think that uh, uh, ever we would reconcile with the representational approach? Uh, do you think representational and uh, eco psych co can coexist uh, in not like in a researcher's head, but but in uh, but in reality, brain could be representational the way we think of representations now and ecological at the same time. Yeah, be because I, yeah. I mean, I, so here's the problem: I just don't think representations do any explanatory work for us, right? Unless you can nail them down to something, right? Yeah. So my. You know, I mean, I know, I, I know, you know, this is a common theme in ecological psychology, but it's like if you, you know, you're if you if you pose the problem of perception and action as an ill-posed problem, there's insufficient information available, right, to pick up the pick up the glass or kick the soccer ball, right? 
then you've created an intractable problem, right? Just from the just from the way you've defined the problem, it's intractable. And so then that forces you to invoke these other things, right? These like representations of prior knowledge that somehow you've acquired in an extrasensory manner, right? I don't believe in extrasensory perception, right? So so you start you start introducing, you know, mysteries, right, in the service of trying to explain something scientifically, right? So talking about representations just doesn't solve anything. Um, and so again, this is kind of a parsimony principle, um, which I, I think we appeal to frequently in science. Um, it's just not doing any work for us, right? Now, I do believe that we can, you know, what, however we are constituted, we can use representations, right? Yeah. I can draw a map, a very abstract, weird map of how to get from, you know, my house to the grocery store, and I can show that to somebody and they can use that representation, even though it's a pretty weird mapping onto physical space, right? right. Um, I can use a language, right, which probably has some representational components to it, right? At least, you know, words denoting things are not yeah. intrinsic. Um, so I can use representational systems, but I don't think that that's a, a you know, we need to understand what the basis for that is. And one of the bases is I have to be able to pair up, you know, the, the representations I'm using, right? Like the word dog yeah. with the thing that it represents, right? With that little furry brown thing that runs around and barks, right? And, and the only way I can do that is if I have some non-representational access to the world, right? So, okay, so you know, we develop language, um, I can map on different words in different languages to that, that same thing, that same dog, because I can perceive the dog in a non-representational way. And if you assume it's representations all the way down, then you can't solve that problem. I mean, this is, this is the problem that the British empiricists were trying to solve, that Helmholtz was trying to solve, and they couldn't solve it. So it's the wrong premise, right? Um, to start with with our, our science. I see. So what if uh, the current representational neuroscience uh, and cognitive science says that what we are looking at is actually a higher level representation and there's actually something beyond this which might not be representational. But we are looking for the, the for that representation or whatever at whatever level you can you can define. Yeah. Right? yeah. So so I mean I think I, I, this is you know, this is very slippery stuff, right? Because in our scientific theories, we use representations to describe whatever is going on in the brain. Yes. So I might I might be able to describe the brain or the neural activity at some level, right? And I can say, well, that's a representation, you know, th this pattern of neural activity is a representation of a dog, okay? But that's me imputing my idea of representation to whatever this neural activity is, right? right? And at the other level, it's just neurons firing, right? In some systematic way, based on the information that's available about the dog. So we just have to be really, really careful not to reify our own descriptions and concepts as being the things in the brain that we're studying, right? There are descriptions of things that, that we don't really understand yet. Right, 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 and we're all the time reifying these these representational ideas as as that's the topic that's going on in the brain. So I, you yeah. know, I, I mean, I yeah. So so it brings me to two points. One, the first is, then what's our role of physiology and looking inside the brain in ecocide? Like, yeah, so I'm not a I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm very hesitant, right, to make big yeah. claims about the brain. Right. Um, I have. I had many interactions with neuroscientists. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was working on optic flow in the 80s and 90s, I, there were a lot of neuroscientists studying single, doing single cell physiology on neurons that looked like they were intimately related to the detection of optic flow patterns. And I thought that was really interesting, right? Um, Barry Frost did really elegant single cell work showing, finding, you know, single cells that were selective for, tau variables, right? So it looked like there was a, a, a kind of neural basis for the detection of information. And I think that was kind of, that's like phase one of ecological neuroscience. It's like, okay, we've identified information. We can yeah. identify neural circuits or neural activity that is detecting that information. 
And then what? <laughs> so what does that you know? So what does that mean? Right. Um, and so I think the sort of so so that was I, you know I have no objection to that at all. I mean I think that was really really interesting. Um, but I think we're kind of phase phase two of ecological neuroscience is kind of what's going on now, which is to say you know that's that's not enough. I mean that was a very local concept of the brain, right? And 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 nervous systems. Um, and I think I do think that the development of neural networks and and complex systems models of you know high dimensional systems like the yeah. brain have really led us in to open up those ideas more. But as someone who's studying vision, right, we we were you know we learn all of that neurophysiology right from the retina on forward through you know the primary visual cortex, you know, the, yeah. you know uh, all the way up to these layers of the brain as if it were this sort of feed forward unidirectional system and everything right. was out in a very local way, right? right? A miracle occurs, right? When you perceive something. Um, but, you know, it turns out that the brain is not like that, <laughs> right. right? There are more, there are more downward connections than upward connections that there's, you know, uh, interactive activity going on all the time, right? In the visual system. And, you know, as now we're in this, this era of deep neural networks, Right, people are beginning to reintroduce recurrent connections and lateral connections, and demonstrating that that solves certain kinds of extracting, as I would say, extracting certain kinds of information that you can't do with yeah. that old school feed forward system. Right, so I think our ideas about the brain are changing, um, and this idea that we have dedicated circuits, right, for particular variables is is changing. Um, you know, there's lots of work showing that the same neuron is is really sensitive to different variables depending on the context of neural activity around it um so it's it you know it's looking more and more and more like this sort of you know complex system that is highly flexible highly adaptive highly interactive and settles right. into stable states depending on many many variables many factors right so I, i'll come I'll, I'll i'll pick up this point again you know the the machine learning and the deep learning ideas, uh, which is a very important point you just mentioned. But before yeah. that, I'll cover the second part, which I, I thought was, uh, when we we talked like as an ecological psychologist, uh, as ecological psychologist, and, I, and when I was introduced to ecological psychology by my PhD advisor, Dorothy Fugazi, during my PhD, uh, it seems very obvious and very intuitive to me, right? And despite the fact that I had read representational uh, neuroscience before, uh, or cognitive psychology, so why do you think that's a case that we see these contradictions so apparent and the lack of explanatory power of representations that still remains the dominant uh, mm -hmm. and dominant not by like, you know, like a, like a close dominance, like a close competition. It, it remains the dominant, like the journals are named like that. The, the whole fields are named in terms of representation. So why is that the case that overall the community is not able to see these contradictions so yeah. well, despite yeah. these things being in like common discussion. Yeah, I, I, so the word, again, the word representation is really slippery, right? Yeah. And there are representations and there are representations. So um, there was a, a really wonderful paper about 10 years ago. Um, I think it was by Barbara Webb um, in, I think, Current Opinion in Neuroscience uh, or Neurobiology, where she identified all the different uses of the word representation in neuroscience. And there were like half a dozen of them, right? Yeah. So people will talk about the neural representation of, you know, orientation tuning, right? The neural representation of orientation detective cell. And it's like, all that means is the chunk of tissue that becomes active when you present an oriented grading, right? To, to yeah. in their receptive field, right? It's not the represent, it's not the word representation in the sense that cognitive scientists often use it. Right. So there, there, there are many different, it's a very slippery term and it's, yeah. it's, um, it's quite fungible, right? I mean, it it's fungible, yeah. you know, all kinds of things and we don't really agree on what we're talking about. So you'd have to be super cautious, I think, in interpreting when people, I, I've kind of just started ignoring the word representation and trying to figure out what they mean, what people mean when they use it. Right. Right. Same thing for internal model. Right. So, so, I mean, you were, you mentioned free energy principle and, you know, and there are, you know, um, kind of neural network models of, of the visual system where they talk about there being a generative model 
kind of embedded in the neurons of the visual system, right? And, you know, that's different from the kind of neural model that cognitive scientists have been talking about where we say, oh, we've got, we create this internal model of the world in our heads. Right. And then we use that in order to interpret these ambiguous images that are coming in. Um, and what they mean is something much closer to what Gibson meant by an attuned visual system, right? It's just that we have, you know, neural neural structure that are that is attuned to the kinds of information we have in our environments. And now people are calling that a generative model of, of the world, right? But it's there, it's it's non-mysterious if there's actually information available, right, that these systems are becoming attuned to. Right. So it's it's you know, I, I just think that it's um easily there's a lot of confusion <laughs> about these words representation and model and what they how they really have to be cashed out. So would this confusion persist? And given that we are a growing community of scientists in general, the more uh, the the bigger the whole uh, you know cognitive neuroscience enterprise, the more the confusion will grow on. Or do you think there will be there are ways to kind of meet together and figure out like okay this concept, okay we all now understand that like this way of functioning doesn't work and let's just drop it. So yeah. we will and <laughs> and let's let's adopt this. Like how would how would the whole sociological landscape would grow? Like, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I just think let a thousand thoughts contend, right? I mean, it's like yeah. there's, you can't like win this argument <laughs> definitively, right? There's going to be some sort of sociological changes that happen over the next few decades, right? And with any luck, the word representation will kind of disappear because it becomes empty. I mean, it come, becomes kind of meaningless. Um, and maybe people will become more precise about what they're talking about. Uh, so it's it's a metaphor, right. and unfortunately, it's it's a very flexible metaphor. Um, so I, I would just say, you know, be as precise as you can be about what you're talking about, right? And, and get rid of the metaphors. Um, but metaphors are, are useful, right, to advance our thinking sometimes. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, who knows how this is gonna how this is gonna progress? But there are times when I feel like there is this sort of convergence happening, even though people don't recognize it. Um, and there are other times when I think, you know, this whole notion of free energy is just like a theory of everything that's not going to that's going to explain nothing, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, so here's an example. So in my lab meeting yesterday, um, one of my graduate students presented a paper on autoencoders, and um, autoencoders are are just data compression devices, image compression devices. They're they're um, model free, they are um, unsupervised, a kind of unsupervised learning. And it, it's basically a neural network that, you know, you, you present a, an, an image to it, you train it on images, and the training is just the network at the other end has to be able to generate the same image. And so what, what it ends up happening is it compresses the information in the images you're putting in to this so-called latent space where there are clusters of data in this latent space. Turns out those clusters correspond to the properties of the world that are specified by that image. And there are a number of demonstrations of this now by Roland Fleming and Fulvio Domini and Jim Tompkins. And so you know, could you elaborate a little more, like for instance, like what kind of. Uh... Okay. So yeah. uh, my colleague Fulvio Domini and James Tompkins and Computer Science at Brown just did this with texture. Okay. So they presented a bunch of texture patterns to the to an autoencoder and all the autoencoder does it's a it's a neural network that ends up compressing the information yeah. down to the minimum description that it, that can then generate that same image again right and then they analyzed the latent space uh after the autoencoder had been trained um and in the latent space the data clustered in just the same way that Jim Todd's data on the perceived shape from texture would predict yeah. Okay, so all an auto all, all an auto encoder is doing is capturing the invariances in the images that are there because all those images are produced by common surfaces, right? There's structure in the surface, there's structure in the image. The auto encoder says the simplest description of this image is in in terms of the structure that's there in the image. Okay, so it pulls out the invariance, 
that's my view of what an autoencoder is doing. Oh, so yeah, I, 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 and just, I see and just, your point. To, just to just to make this point, right? Yeah. It's like um, uh, Vicente Raja recently published a paper in which he used an autoencoder as an example of a resonant system, right? That is is tuned to invariance. I think that's probably right. Okay, but now we read this kind of deep learning, you know, neural net paper on using autoencoders to um, extract information from optic flow patterns. And their framework is Helmholtzian, right? It's like yeah. oh, the autoencoder is a generative model, right? It's learning a generative model of, of the world and the information and it can reproduce, you know, these, you know, it's like, how can we be looking at the same so, thing? So I, a... This is just the thing that finds invariance in, in yeah. patterns, right? And they look at it and say, this is a Helmholtzian device that does, you know, inference based on a generative model. And it's like, shoot me now, right? It's, you know, but eventually we're going to converge, I hope, on what these things are, are actually capable of doing in a, in a simple way, right? Rather than imposing this metaphysical, you know, interpretation yeah. from Helmholtz on it. It's like, you know. No, there, there's a deep irony there because, and, and this brings me to the next question I plan to ask you. Uh, so this is actually, and uh, what our auto encoders are doing is kind of supporting the ecological idea or the idea of uh, invariance perception. However, when you look at uh, the mainstream vision neuroscience, and there was actually a recent article yesterday, which made a lot of news, uh, discussing how neuroscientists have discovered uh, that the brain uses deep learning kind of phenomena because they were able to predict something using a deep learning uh, network in terms of perception, right? It's all about the news. And exactly as you said, it's just the other way around. What the model is showing is that the brain might be using invariance rather than brain might be actually using deep learning kind of concepts. So it's, it's more it about depends, the invariance. It depends on how the how the network is trained, right? Yeah. So yeah. if it's supervised learning, yeah. then you're you're kind of you're building your prior knowledge back into. No, this is un, I think this is unsupervised. I think that okay. was the that was the feat there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and I'm not I I'm not trying to propose that the brain itself is doing what an autoencoder does. Yeah. Right? You know, to like regenerate images, there might be something analogous going on as yeah. we're during perceptual learning. Right, but what's interesting about it is it's just it's just a way of demonstrating that there's sufficient information in optical information to solve the structure to to recover the structure of the world, right? Uh, but but is it uh, isn't that the whole philosophy of unsupervised learning that if an unsupervised auto encoder is able to extract and reproduce, uh, you know, the image that means you don't need representations. You, you. Yeah, I, I agree. Right. Yeah, I agree. But 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 you know people with other assumptions will look, look at that, yeah. you know, at the autoencoder and say, oh, it's you know it's formed a generative model right of images to environments and it is uh, performing inference right and it's like why introduce all this intentional language when it's just right, right. a com it's, a, it's just a compressed you know um, description of the information that's in the uh, no, that's a that's a phenomenal understanding. So, are you planning to write kind of a piece on that? I mean, taking all this evidence together and saying, like, see, uh, here's where you know the, I mean, here's the here's the party. So I will I will let Vicente do that. <laughs> okay. I mean, I you know so yeah. Um, there's so many papers like that I would love to write, right? right. But it involves you know, drilling down into that particular literature to a degree that, you know, I just don't have time. Right, right. <laughs> like, I see what's, you know, I have, I, I have my understanding of what's going on. Um, I'm trying to learn all the time, right? But it's like, but to actually make that case, yes. you know, it requires a huge, a huge amount of, of time and effort. Right. Um, and there, I mean, and look, I, I, you know, basically I have put my chips down on experimental research, Right. I mean, that's my strength, figuring out how to do how to design experiments that will test these theories. Um, you know, how to use things like VR, which is kind of controversial in ecological psychology, to actually, you know, do what Gibson said we needed to do, which is to make the laboratory look like life. You know, we can get pretty close to that now. Um, and so that's that's my strength, right? I read philosophy. I have a courtesy appointment in the philosophy department at Brown. I've learned a lot from my colleague. Um, my colleagues at, at uh, in philosophy at Brown, um, Chris Hill in particular is somebody I've interacted with frequently over the years. I don't agree with Chris, but I've learned a ton from him. Yeah. Um, 
But you know, I am not going to write the philosophical argument that's going to convince anybody. <laughs> I think that you know I'm going to proceed down my research path, and if you can find solid solid research results for some of these things, that may be more convincing in the long run. And I think I think right. Vicente would say the same thing. It's like yeah, you know, people are making these arguments. It's very hard to convince someone. It's very hard to convince a neuroscientist. Yeah, you know, based on philosophical argument, it's kind of like hopeless. So um, I think it's important to think about those problems and to get your your kind of ontology straight, right, right. to the extent you can. Um, but I'll let Vicente try to, you know, get everybody how to teach everyone how to reinterpret autoencoders. Right. And at the same time, uh, I mean, it kind of explains that there's a, there are value to adapting these tools for ecological psychologists as well. Which tools? Uh, I mean, I mean things like uh, machine learning, things like uh, deep learning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Given that well, there there has been traditionally a little apathy in the ecological psychology community to adapt the same kind of methods or to deal with the same kind of neurophysiological data, which yeah. uh, which the representational community has been uh, dealing with. Yeah. So so. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think I think those are worthwhile worthwhile efforts, right? And right. if you believe. I mean, if you kind of believe in the scientific process, right? Hopefully, there will be some convergence, right? If we get right. in, if we get more information about the way the brain is actually working, um, hopefully, some of our ideas will pan out. Some of them might not. Um, my favorite example is right now is we've got you know you've got this idea that uh, an autoencoder is a way that the visual system might work something like an autoencoder, right? That our attuned perceptual systems. Yeah, are attuned to these informational invariants that are, you know, kind of have a kind of structural correspondence with the properties of the environment, right? And that's what's connecting us to the environment. Um, and so, on that view, what the what an attuned perceptual system is is a very, uh, you know, uh, specifically tuned set of of neural circuits, right? On the other hand, I've been really interested with this idea of um, reservoir networks or reservoir computing. Yeah which is the opposite idea, right? And that idea is you take your kind of visual input, your visual information, and you blow it into this hot, super high dimensional space, right? So a reservoir network is a set of nodes that are interconnected um, and they're kind of randomly connected, although there may, there's some structure to the way the connections are done that, that improve its performance. And then you just kind of map it to an output layer and the only modifiable weights in a reservoir network are to the output layer. So you like you, you put some information into the system and it resonates, it vibrates, it echoes. The originally where they were called echo state networks. And it just goes on and on, right? And so you get this, all these units in this reservoir network are pulling out multiple components of whatever the this input signal was right so you're taking the input signal you're blowing it into the super high dimensional space you're not compressing it down you know yeah. to the fundamental invariance you're blowing it as high dimensional and then you can read out whatever you want right in this output layer so you can get one of the early demonstrations of the power of these things was a science paper by um jaeger where he showed that it will predict a chaotic signal Right, so you put a chaotic temporal signal into a reservoir network. It blows it up into, establish, you know, pulls out all these different spatial yeah. temporal or temporal components of the signal, and will then predict. You know, you can you input a certain number of time steps of the signal, and it will predict an equal number of time steps before it starts to drift away from uh, the subsequent signal. So that's dependent on deterministic chaos, but it's like this is what you know. We were all trying to do <laughs> we were talking about synchronizing to a chaotic signal or yeah um, you know do, doing a com kind of complexity matching or 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 um you know strong anticipation you know these things do that right in fact my they do it better than i think humans do right so maybe so, this is not a plausible a plausible model so, so so in that case we are not yet sure but you know like whether brain might be working uh you know in the scheme of water encoder or as a reservoir computer right. So the two opposite extremes, right? Yeah. Both, both, both plausible, right? We just don't know. So my my favorite example of this is that, you know, in the uh, people 
so we had a reading group at Brown for many years with um, John Donahue and Jerome Sains in neuroscience, where they were studying, you know, the motor cortex. Yeah. And, um, you know, we read through, you know, a bunch of papers on, you know, uh, I mean, like, um, um, you know, all, all the papers on uh, kind of direction neurons and motor cortex that, that corresponded with the direction of reaching and so on. Um, and John pursued all of that work, John Donahue, and, and then got interested in doing the kind of brain gate work. Yeah, BCI. Out yeah. the motor cortex, right? And use yeah. that for very, uh, clinical purposes, which are amazing, right? Um, and then going back to the motor cortex, John's view now, and I hope I'm not quoting him out of school here, is what is the motor cortex doing? Everything, everywhere, all at once, right? right. It's not this neat little map of kind of spatial, you know, like we imagine the visual system to be this sort of mapping yeah. locations in the motor cortex to di reaching directions or forces or something. Right. It does all that stuff and it reconfigures all the time, right? Depending right. on the context of the movement. So it's behaving, in my words, much more like an adaptive complex system than it is like, you know, a highly specific map. Right. I mean, there's a growing uh, evidence and acceptance in the motor control community that no matter where you actually, you know, uh, poke the electrodes, you can find correlates of, of movement. And whether, I mean, the earlier idea that the neurons were coding for direction or velocity, I mean, those are also kind of murky now because they're almost uncoding whichever variable you want. Yeah. So that was a that was something I heard at a uh, important conference in my history when I was a postdoc. Right, that was said by a visual neuroscientist too. It's like you poke an electrode anywhere in the visual cortex, you can find something that's going to respond to any stimulus. Right. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that cell is uniquely tuned to that stimulus, but it's like it's it's very it's a very powerful system that's responding to all kinds of things. Right. So, so it's just possible that our concepts are are not sufficient, right? Are not up to are not adequate to what the brain is actually doing, but hopefully we will. Right, you know, we'll get. I, I had on last episode uh, Professor Luis uh, Pessoa from uh, uh, Maryland, and uh, he has a book recently called The Untangled Brain. Yeah, and the in the whole uh, book basically he is actually trying to showcase the problem and the walls which neuroscience is hitting. Uh, not so much on the solution, uh, but a hint on the complexity. Uh, but but it's it's a it's a very general kind of dissatisfaction which is growing now in the neuroscience community of 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 phase two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I th and I do think that that the kind of people interested in ecological neuroscience have a role to play there. Um, I just think it's early days, right? It's like yeah. we're going to find the brain is doing things that we just don't understand yet. Um, so I, I I I prefer to look under the street lamp <laughs> where I, that I have um, and look at the kind of higher level regularities that I can find in, you know, in information and behavior, right, action, yeah. um, and and just kind of trust that somehow the brain is doing this, right? That's the function the brain needs to perform. How the brain is performing that function could be done in many different ways. So would you like to elaborate, like, what are some of the questions you are addressing currently in your lab? Uh, related yeah, to sure. I mean, I, let, me, yeah. let me just say one more thing about ecological neuroscience that I, I do think that the basic insight that ecological psychology has to bring to neuroscience is that, you know, the object of analysis is not from the, from the retina, right, to yeah. the frontal lobes, right? It's like, or to the motor cortex. It's, it's the brain is just one component embedded in a system that right. behaves in a highly systematic way, right? So right. the you know the brain is in a body, the body is an environment. All, that whole system runs by physical laws and optical laws and laws of self organization. Um, and so you know if you pull the brain out of that embedded system, it makes it impossible to understand what's going on. Right. So by, by embedding it in that system, we have maybe a better hope, right, of understanding what the, the right. functions. That and, and it becomes even more complex when you're talking about social cognition or social interactions or, or human coordination, then it becomes like even more interactable because now yeah. you have two brains interacting through uh, through information, which is, I mean, they're, 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 the, the layers just grow 
right uh, and definitely right and that's this you know so this idea that you're going to have an internal model that's predictive of how every other person you're interacting right. with is going to behave you know given their personality structure or whatever right it's like it's just hopeless i think it's hopeless right so we've got to we've got to think about this in a different way right no that's completely true so uh, coming back to your your lab like what are some of the uh, big questions that you are actively pursuing uh, and what kind of approaches uh, and technologies you are using yeah yeah so we we you know 25 years ago we kind of committed to virtual reality as a a technique 25 years ago yeah it was in 1998 99 we built the ven lab so yeah. and before that you know i'd been trying to create something like that like with a a projection screen in front of a treadmill um with a closed loop like a tracker on your head that would generate appropriate optic flow on the screen and it was just um, not quite there yet. And so we, you know, we started building this virtual environment lab in, in 1998, 1999. And my um, graduate student and then postdoc Andrew Duchan was instrumental in constructing the lab and putting it together. You know, and at that time, a single, the best HMD head mounted display we could find cost, you know, $30,000, right? It was like buying a Porsche, you know, at that point. Yeah. And we had two Porsches in the lab, right? Because it, they broke all the time. They were crappy pieces of equipment, right? And they broke all the time, but it was the best we had. You know, and then flash forward to, you know, about 15 years. And now, you know, you could start buying an Oculus Quest for, you know, $400 that would be way outperform these $30,000 HMDs we'd, we'd started with. So it's like the golden age. Like, I feel like I'm living through the golden age of, yeah. of this technique. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and we've just gone with it, right? So we're, we're using whatever the current HMD is and trying to, you know, maximize um, our use of, of the, the power of these things now. They're hot and the resolution's better. The latency is almost negligible. You know, so they're really, they're really quite, quite powerful devices. Yeah. Um, and so that allows you to manipulate the environment or to create any environment that you want and to manipulate the information in a way that violates the laws of optics or physics. Yeah. So we've done things like, um, you know, so one one project that emerged out of that was um, kind of looking, I, I collaborated with Mike Tarr, who was a cognitive scientist at Brown at the time, and Leslie Cabling, who was a roboticist at Brown. And um, we started looking at at spatial navigation. Like what is, what is our understanding of the environment um, beyond the sensory horizon? So I thought, okay, this is my, this is a challenge to me as a Gibsonian. I've been studying affordances and optic flow and based on information that I have available to me now, but how do I get to my car in the parking lot when I can't see my car, right? That's got to be grounded in information in some way, right? And Gibson has some passages about this in his 1966 book where he talks about, you know, kind of an extended array that extends over time, even to things yeah, you can't, right. right? Begins to sound a little mysterious. Um, but there's something there. So we we kind of, this was a project we could all agree on. We wrote the grant, built the Venn lab, you know, and um, and I was the only one who kind of continued in that vein for another another 10 or 15 years. And we're still doing some work on that. So that sort of spatial navigation, is a, it's a really great problem. And I think the idea that we were started attacking, right, is this concept that we have a Euclidean cognitive map in our heads is again, a manifestation of that old, you know, assumption that we have a model in our heads. Right. Um, we have some sort of knowledge, right? But I don't think it. I don't think it's a Euclidean map, and that knowledge that we have is grounded in in perceptual experience and perceptual information that we have as we learn a new environment. So that was the kind of angle that we took, and we had a kind of non-Euclidean, more topological understanding of what spatial knowledge was. That that even some people who are studying. Um, um, you know, the hippocampus and place cells in the hippocampus, they're also raising questions about this concept of a, of a cognitive map. Right. Is that really and a place, right. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole idea of place cells is also uh, controversial uh, in some, in certain ways. Yeah. And, and grid cells too, right? Grid, yeah, cells, grid cells too, yeah. Thought of as kind of, you know, okay, that's what, that's a metric for space, right? It, yeah. It's two by path integration. And yeah, that idea is not, it's, it's like they could be doing a lot of other things too, so. Right. But, but you know, from my line of research, right, starting with optic flow, I really wanted to study 
how people get around in a structured environment, right? So locomotion, kind of the visual control of locomotion problem, which really comes from David Lee um, and, and originally from Gibson. So we began to kind of use VR to, to break that problem down and say, all right, how do I steer toward a goal, right? Can I understand my locomotor trajectories as the product of my interaction with a target in the three in the world, right? And then can I model that as a dynamical system so that rather than assuming that I plan my path based on a perceived, you know, as David Marr would say, we kind of perceive the Euclidean structure of the world, we create a model of the world, and then we can do anything with that. We can plan a path, we can, you know, pick up a glass, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a completely general model. And, you know, we were skeptical about that. It looked like there were more special purpose relations between information and the tasks that we were doing. And so we tried to approach, you know, generating a locomotor path, not dissimilar to how people generate a reaching trajectory, right? So a locomotor trajectory based on information, a reach trajectory based on where the, you know, where you where the target is, right? And the dynamics of generating action with that action system. So we started building these little, you know, dynamical second order dynamical systems that would predict, uh, that would capture the trajectories. And it turned out they were very predictive. People behaved very systematically. So then we said, all right, what about obstacles? Can we like avoid an obstacle right on the way to a goal? Can we describe that in the same way? And yes, it was quite generative. So, you know, a, a target, a goal is an attractor of heading, right? And a obstacle is a repeller of heading. And I, I, I put those two things together and I get a trajectory that, that is repelled away from the direction of the obstacle and attracted into the direction of the target. And that was predictive, right? That would predict the kinds of paths that people would take. It would predict when people, as I change the position of the obstacle, it would change, it would predict when the trajectory would change, right? From one side of the obstacle to the other side of the obstacle. And so then we began, you know, getting, just adding components, right? So the vision yeah. was, you could now say, okay, what about a moving target? Can you intercept a moving target? And we have a pretty decent model of that. Can you avoid a moving obstacle? I have a pretty, we're, we're finalizing now after yeah. years, a, a good model of that. Um, can you follow another pedestrian, right? Um, yeah, so we developed, we've developed a model of that. And so ultimately the goal was to say, as I make the environment more complicated, can I still predict the trajectories that people are gonna take just by combining all these nonlinear dynamical systems together into a higher level structure. And so far, so good, right? So far, we're doing pretty well at, at, at that game yeah. plan. Um, ultimately, I, I was interested in this problem of self-organization in you know, bird flocks and fish schools and, and human crowds. So in the back of our minds, that's where we always wanted to get to. Right, right? We just right. did the approach it in a sort of bottom-up way by can we model an individual pedestrian how they interact with objects how they interact with other pedestrians and then can we generalize to this problem of collective motion and so that's what we've been doing in the last gosh i guess half a dozen or more years now um where we have developed this model of how one pedestrian follows another yeah. pedestrian right and then you start combining these say okay well maybe this pedestrian is combining all the people that in, in the field of view just by averaging their motions together and does that predict how i follow a crowd and yes it does quite well right so we do these virtual environments where we have a virtual crowd we put a human in the virtual crowd and then we can you know perturb different people in the virtual crowd and if half the people in the crowd turn and half the people don't the pedestrian, the subject, right, will follow still the average of those motions, right, in their fields of view. And so that turns out to be quite predictive. And the most recent step was to say, okay, so now let's go back to the question of visual information. So how am I, you know, what are the optical variables that I'm using yeah. to follow somebody, okay, or to avoid somebody, right? And if I use, if I now translate my collective behavior model using those optical variables, will that work, right? And it turns out it predicts the data better than if you start with the assumption that you're perceiving the motions of all of your neighbors in, in 3D space. So I feel like we're kind of getting to still problems with that model, 
Yeah. Right. But we now have a kind of a visual model that generates collective motion. And then um, we've been doing agent based simulations of these models. And most recently, Ben Philandes is uh, a postdoc who's. I, to- I met him at. Uh- at Guadalajara, yeah. Yeah, that's right. He's in yeah. So, and he's been and we, he's been also doing work on on uh, yeah. reservoir networks too. So, uh, but he's now got a faculty position at the University of Arizona. So good for him. Yeah. Um, but he created, you know, we've had me- many passes at creating a simulator, but he's got a pretty good. He created a pretty good simulator, so we can do multi-agent simulations of our models. And indeed, right yeah. under under some conditions, it generates collective motion. We've now been looking at most recently at bifurcations in this crowd behavior. Um, so when you know if you're if you're following a crowd and half the crowd turns one way, right, and half the crowd turns the other way, do you still average, right? Because if you averaged, you're really going to kind of miss both groups as they right. as they move on, right? So averaging is not adaptive at some point, point. Um, and it turns out that individuals undergo a bifurcation in their behavior. At some point, as the angle between the two groups gets bigger, you stop averaging and start following one group or the other. So it it behaves like a pitchfork bifurcation. And so we can modify our agent-based model um, in a simple way that actually generates, reproduces that behavior. And then you simulate that in this agent-based, multi-agent simulations, and you can get the crowd to split. Okay. Right. All of the agents are following the same, the same, uh, have the same uh, control laws, right? You can explain how crowds might split under some conditions. And so we're really kind of pursuing that, that idea of there's self-organization, not only in this sort of collective motion, but in kind of collective decision-making as well. No, I mean, beautiful stuff. I mean, if you, if, if you walk, you know, like uh, New York, uh, I mean, a, a busy junction in New York or like Tokyo, you see these crowds of hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, you know, moving like that and kind of bifurcating. And you see similar kind of behavior in bird flocks as well, right? You often see bird flocks dividing into two. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you yeah. wonder who made the decision and 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 how come the last bird followed. Right. And which group it followed, yeah. Right, right. And so, I mean, I think, you know, there have been models of that sort of thing, you know, in computer graphics with Craig Reynolds, who had some of the kind of early computer graphics models that was used to produce you know, the will to be stampede in the Lion King and stuff like that. Um, and then there are mathematical biologists who've been also creating models and right. physicists, there are many models, but but very few of them are tied to data, right? right and so, right. I, you know, what's, what's the contribution of a perception action guy? Well, it's actually to do the experiments to test, okay, what are the yeah. effect control laws that humans actually follow? Right. Um, yeah, so it, it brings to the, the this idea, right? You can always model based on data. For example, Ian Cousins work a lot of work with you know uh, with herd behavior, and yeah. that's basically modeling the movement itself. Yeah, uh, and then relating it to perception action, which is basically uh, you know uh, what you just described happening in your lab. It's a, a, a two different things. Yeah, and, and yeah. a lot of what we know about collective behavior is data driven and not perception act grounded in perception action. And yeah, so, so, perception I mean, yeah. it's it's a problem I think we're all familiar with. It's right, complex yeah. systems are are degenerate, right? Right. There are many many ways, right, that a system can get out the same behavior uh, through the. There are many different kinds of local interactions that will generate the same global behavior. Right. And this has been this is now for about ten years has really been understood in the collective behavior world as well. There are a few key papers that make that point. So it's not sufficient to just model data right because right. there are a number of equivalent models that will all describe the data so you really have to drill down right, right. And experimentally test if i intervene if i do the experiment right how do how do these how does this species actually respond to that kind of information so this applies to a lot of complex system models in physics as well right which yeah. we use to describe human behavior might not be applicable the same way they might need uh, the additional uh, you can call like constraints of perception to be able to apply, right? Yeah. I, I think that's right. And, you know, and, and I understand, you know, I'm that, you know, they're thinking like a physicist and it, it might be good for us to think like physicists more right. too. Right. Okay. But, you know, from a, a physicist is always looking for universality, right? Right. It's like, what's the kind of minimal model that will produce all of these phenomena, right? Yeah. And that's really important. 
But we're also studying biological systems, right? And for me, I think, you know, what's the difference between me and a hurricane, okay? It's like somehow biology has um, um, leveraged these principles of self-organization for adaptive behavior, right? Right. And so the, the kind of combination, it's not, we're not simply behaving like physical systems. We're exploiting this, right, the uh, physics yeah. right, in order to, as, as biological systems, to, to be adaptive, right? Right. And, you know, and so that's, you know, this, this is one of the puzzles, I think, um, that we, as we are inspired more by physics, it's like, well, what's the difference between me and a sand pile? Yes. Well, it's like, I'm adaptive. A sand pile just goes into this self-organized criticality all the time, right? That's what it does. But somehow a biological system is able to leverage that self-organized criticality to be creative, right? I mean, to generate alternative uh, solutions and behave adaptively. So, you know, we're not just a sand pile. Right. And, and what exactly is that, that element we still do not know? Yeah, it's right. something, I mean, you know, so this is where you begin to say, um, well, maybe biology has something to bring to physics, right? Or psychology has something to bring to physics that, that these, these principles are somehow being, you know, adaptively <laughs> uh purpose there there's some teleology here right that we don't right. understand how to describe so this brings to a common uh criticism of eco that we lack intentionality we are the dynamics people and we all we are doing is describing dynamics where exactly is the intentionality coming from right well but i mean i think that's the that's the peril i mean as we have you know, appealed more and more to physical models, which I think is absolutely right, right? And we use dynamical systems models as well. Yeah. It's like you you can't forget that we're also biological systems that, um, ha, you know, achieve, find stability, achieve stability, right? Right. Uh, preserve, preserve our intact, our, ourselves as intact organisms that, that have to be adaptive and flexible um, as well as just locked into stable solutions. Right. So, um, you know, so there's something, you know, we're pushing the boundaries of what, of what physics actually can do. Definitely. So Professor Warren, uh, we are, we are very, uh, we are reaching the end of the discussion. A couple of things before we end uh, today's uh, meet is uh, where do you think uh, is, what are some of the big questions in eco -psych which are like uh, very pertinent and also immediate, which we should address, uh, should we, want to remain relevant yeah. and the second is uh where exactly is the paralysis uh, uh in the current eco -psych? and if there is some uh and how can we get rid of that and actually get the inertia and the ball rolling uh in the way we would like uh, <laughs> uh, you know? that, that's a tall that's a tall order um yeah yeah it's interesting to me that um so you said uh, a little while ago that you felt that ecological psychology was kind of in the ascendancy at the moment, yeah. right? That there's a lot of new activity. Where do you think, so tell me where you think that is coming from. The ascendancy? Yeah. Uh, I think we have got more open to, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to explain. There's the ascendancy coming from. I think definitely there's a lot of good work being done by the previous generation in training uh our next generation so so that's that's part of it uh, uh the second thing is that uh, we are kind of seeing where the traditional approaches are hitting the wall yes the the we are seeing the dissatisfaction and we are seeing value in ecological ideas mm -hmm. more than ever before mm -hmm. so that's encouraging because i i mean yeah. i also have the feeling that in um you know, I'm not even sure how to assess this, but there have been waves of interest in ecological psychology, right? I think there was yeah. a big wave in the 80s, right? Thanks to, you know, the work of, you know, Gibson's last book, Ulrich Neisser at Cornell, the group at UConn, and that yeah. kind of propagated, right, from there. Um, but that also turned people off, right? It looked, it looked too doctrinaire. Um, and so right. I think you know, that was a consequence. So we've seen these sort of waves and there was a point, you know, when I felt 
you know, maybe in the 90s, it's like optic flow was really big. You know, we're really making inroads in yeah. the kind of psychology meetings and vision science meetings that I go to. Um, people were looking, it was, they were looking at all these new phenomena. The haptics work was really interesting. Um, and then we had this sort of, you know, big wave again of um, internal models and optimal control theory in yeah. motor control. And, you know, and it was kind of beaten back, it felt like. Um, and, uh, you know, and now deep learning, right? Everybody has abandoned, <laughs> you know, the idea of information is just, oh, just throw them, just throw a deep right. learning network at it, right? No problem. Yeah. It'll just figure it out. Well, there, you know, we're now finally learning the limits of that. So, I mean, the, 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 all of these fields proceed in waves and there are fads of the moment that come and go. Right. And I just have to, so it's interesting to me that you see ecological ideas, maybe kind of more penetrating neuroscience recently um because i'm not as connected to that but i do feel like um if if our ideas are are strong ideas if we have a a better way of thinking we if if information really matters okay right. people are going to discover that right so there's going to be some convergence on that um and and it's going to play a role in neuroscience if if concepts of dynamics and complex systems and stability and metastability are, are really useful ideas, other people are gonna converge on them too. And there is this sort of wave of dynamical neuroscience that really doesn't cite any of us. Oh <laughs> yes, I mean- right? But it's like, but now they're, yeah, they're coming to understand, right? These are, these are you know, uh, like kind of functional networks that come and go and it's like, and they resonate and there's, right. you know, and it's like, you know- and there, there was are, a recent paper in a, in a high impact journal called uh, something related to turbulence in the brain. And yeah. Uh, recently, like uh, in 2023 or 2022, and uh, had a lot of news all over the place. And I was like, turbulence in the brain? I mean, the ecocide community has been showing turbulence through all kinds of mathematical models and almost every physiological right. signal. Right. And Walter so, Freeman had these ideas in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. You know I mean? It's like, right. yeah. So it's like, so, um, so I, but I, you can take courage from that, right? You can say, right, right, right. people are going to discover this if there's, if there's a there there. Right. In fact, I mean, Gregory right, was, are, are just not going to work out. They're right. not going to come out and they're going to be forced to, to more complex right. ideas. And, and you have this, I mean, it's it's percolating neuroscience like left and right. So, for example, Buzaki's book, The Brain from Outside In or in, you know, the uh, something, something of that order, which talks about the importance of environment in the brain in, in understanding the brain. And yeah. then Scott Grafton has a book uh, where uh, the body matters. Yeah. Uh, so there are these kind of eureka realizations in the neuroscience community, yeah. uh, but they have a tendency in general to present it as an as a new epiphany compared to citing an ecological literature. But well, yeah, right, right. So I mean, and yeah. I, you know, I think you know, in the in the kind of '90s and early 2000s, there was this big wave of the what I call the five E's, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Bodied and active, embedded, um, uh, and in ecological. A, a lot of their five evol were, now evolution, yeah, fifth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so, but I think ecological anticipated most of those movements, right? Most of those yeah. developments, and and there's a kind of unification that's been happening. They don't, everyone doesn't agree, right? But there's kind of unification. So I've been interested that I, you know, where I see the most movement at the moment is in is in philosophy, right? So there are all these European philosophers who've been gotten interested in ecological psychology. Some of them out of the inactive movement. Yeah. Um, and they're publishing up a storm, right? And bringing right. bringing this, you know, to to more a more kind of a wider audience than than we could as as researchers. Right. Um, but I worry that that the actual research is lagging behind. I agree with you. Uh, the I empirical to... work is not keeping up with the philosophical uh, articulation or in general uh, imagination of philosophers is much much vivid than <laughs> than the experimental evidence in our community yeah but i i mean i think that's i i think that's yeah. fine right it's just yeah. that the the philosoph i think we need the philosophical arguments right and yeah. i i believe in you know, i believe in philosophy i think it's important to get our ontologies and our, right. our our ideas straight but um without the the experimental and research efforts right right if you we're not going to convince the field i completely <laughs> agree with you Right. And fact, so I think I still think we have to push forward on on basic research. Right. In fact, we can actually have a model where we have an empirical data and we can present it both in a traditional way as well as uh, 
uh, in, in ecological interpretation, uh, you know, or, or discuss at least what we would have interpreted it had we not ecologically informed uh, as a... Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I, I do think it's important for us to cite our our sources, right? To cite the sources yes. of our ideas and our motivations so that that, that doesn't get lost. Um, right. Because I think you know people still have this experience of picking up one of Gibson's books and saying, "Oh my God, right. <laughs> this is a different way of thinking about it that I really need to consider." Um, so Jim me. Todd and I are right in this vein, right? I'm on sabbatical this year, and Jim Todd and I are working on a book, which is kind of a status report on ecological optics, and so we're focusing on you know the territory we are most familiar with, and. Um, but trying to show that that since Gibson's writings, we've had huge advances in our understandings of information, mathematical formulation of, yeah. of information, um, and that we can solve a lot of problems, and we cannot solve other problems, right? With this with this way of thinking, um, and so Jim is doing the work on on kind of the perception of, you know, of objects and shape and structure, and I'm doing kind of visual control of action part of the book. But it, it, we're trying to like integrate these ideas around this concept of information and, and trying to demonstrate that if you, if you can identify information, you can solve a lot of these problems um, without invoking mysterious prior knowledge. Right. That's wonderful. So when is the book coming out? God only knows. We're just, we're writing it now. So Okay. Um, but but yeah. do you also already have the contract in place or... No, we've decided we, we're going to write. We're we're writing some sample chapters before we. Uh, I see. We do that. One of our okay. one of our actually debates is whether to publish this in paper. I still I still imagine right the graduate student twenty five years from now pulling a book off a library shelf and saying, much as I did with Gibson, saying, "Oh my God, there's another way to think about this." Yeah. Um, but no one's going to the library anymore, so maybe the right way to do this is as a an you know an ebook that could have all the animations and all the, you know, the high resolution images to really illustrate what we're talking about. Right, so that's true. Let's figure that out. Right, but at the same time, I mean, there's a debate generally, right? Like when you have like a, I mean, in this case, you're writing it yourself, but when you have a collection of edited uh, chapters, you publish it as an edited, uh, uh, a journal issue, a special issue, or you publish it as an edited volume. Yeah. I personally kind of like the idea of edited volume because when I look back my graduate years, I was like the most I learned were from this these books uh, with edited chapters, uh -huh. uh, and you can have like twenty five perspectives within the same book, yeah, uh, within the same volume, and that was much more convincing than going to a journal and and reading like, you know, ten articles from different authors. You know, I think that works if the chapters are accessible in the same way that journal articles are accessible, right? Because yeah, people often they're not physical books anymore, right? I mean, it's. I mean, they do, but it's, but it's, um, you know, I, I, even, you know, even I who believes in books, right? When I sit down at my computer, I'm pulling up PDFs. Right. Uh, and I think it it really does need to be accessible electronically. Right. So uh, no, I very much look forward to, you know, this book uh, whenever it comes out. Yeah, me too. Uh, so Professor Warren, you mentioned uh, David Marr uh, in the conversation a few minutes back. So David Marr was ahead of his time, you know, when you look back what was happening during that time. Uh, and he was, he had some similarities in how he thought with Gibson as well as, as well as differences. Now, he has been very influential to an extent that, like, I can go to an extent that I will call, like, he has become like a cult in certain neuroscience community. And there are certain departments which, which think exactly the way David Marr proposed in his uh, tri-level framework. So where do you see, uh, and, and that appeals more to the computational approaches than the eco-psych approaches. Where do you see David Marr uh, relevant to eco-psych or, or his trial level? Or are, is there any relevance or not? To I, mean, I, think, I think David Marr's thinking has been, you know, surpassed by, you know, probabilistic models in the 90s, you know, yeah. kind of beta models, and now, you know, deep neural network models. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Marr was, was kind of pivotal at the time of his death and the time his book was published. Yeah. Um, the trial level, you know, uh, framework I think is still with us. Um, I have mixed feelings about it, um, but I think you know let's just not let's not forget that they were reading Gibson at MIT in the 1970s, yeah. and a lot of Mars' 
you know, thinking was motivated by, by Gibson. What Gibson had proposed and, and what he saw as the shortcomings in Gibson. So there was this famous passage where Marr says, um, Gibson got the computational level right. You know, what Marr calls the computational level. For us, it's like the functional level of yeah. information and environmental constraints. Um, but he underestimated the problem of, you know, our brain actually detecting this stuff, you know, using this information. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I just don't think Gibson was that interested, you know, in those in that implementation problem. He did write about it in his 1966 book. And at the time, I mean, it was pretty prescient, actually, at the time that he talked about networks attuned to these higher order variables and, you know, and this idea of resonance, you know, which is kind of keeps coming back to haunt us. Um, but in terms of Mars theories about how these computations were done, I, I think it just didn't pan out, right? His algorithms were very brittle. They didn't generalize to natural images very well. Um, and that led the whole field of computer vision to more probabilistic approaches where you could cope with noisy images and stuff like that. So, you know, that leaves us with the kind of three level framework, right? right? And I, you know, I do think a lot of ecological psychology is still focused at that higher level you know, computational or functional level of what's the problem the visual system and perceptual systems are trying to solve, yeah. what's the information available under these ecological constraints. And people still don't accept that, right? Um, at least Mar accepted that. Uh, but, you know, the algorithmic level, and, and clearly there's a kind of implementation level that's probably many levels, right? It's not just one, yeah. right? But so there's some complex neural system that is somehow the causal support for these functions that are being computed. The algorithmic level is the problematic one, right? And that's where I think that really the algorithmic level is more important for our understanding of what we think the brain might be doing. That and we have to be careful about not reifying that in the brain, right? right. I have kind of a very ambivalent feeling about the so-called algorithmic level because I don't think there are algorithms being computed anywhere. Right. 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 But for, you know, for us, it's like, well, when I, when I write a model of, you know, some sort of visual processing, you know, my model is kind of like an algorithmic model. Right. right. But I just I want to be careful not to impute. However, I'm simulating that to the operations that the brain is, is performing. Right. But when you look at the work by uh, uh, folks like, uh, Wolfram right now and his interest in chat GTP kind of large language models and how he's trying to explain those and in terms of understanding. Uh, it, there's an emergence in consensus among that breed of computational uh, physicist or biologist is that when you have a complex system with so many degrees of freedom, any complex system can actually over time with attunement might be able to, you know, implement or, uh, you know, acquire these kind of invariants. So, right. so, so, so that kind of uh, uh, fuses the two levels together of implementation and uh, uh, and uh, this one uh, computation, right? Like maybe. I mean, I, so what do you mean by computation? So like you mean the higher level? Yeah, the higher level. level yeah. Level. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you know somehow that's got to be true, right? Right. And I think the Vicente's formulation of you know somehow the same information is constraining behavior and constraining neural activity. Right, right, right. And that's a that's not a bad way to think about it. Um, but then what's the job that the brain is doing, right? Um, it's Is it just preserving informational structure, right? You know, what is what is the 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 role of, of the neural implementation? I see. So, I, you know, I, I still prefer, I mean, I think those are great puzzles. Yeah. I admire neuroscientists. Be humble about thinking you understand how the brain works. And I just prefer to work at a level of generality that is, right. is a little higher than the brain, right? It's like there are a lot of different brains, right? And one of my one of my favorites, not, there's no guarantee that all brains are working the same way. All right. And one of my okay. favorite examples is um, you know, the time to contact variable, right? So this sort of tau variable. You know, we've now done the analysis in pigeons in uh, my former graduate student, Nico Hatsopoulos, did it in locusts. Um, you know, we've done it in you know, primates and monkeys. You know, so all these different species, 
And the neural circuits for detecting optical expansion are, are different, okay, in these different species. So it's like, what's the right level of description to capture the generality, right? So yeah. that informational variable is constraining a lot of behavior in a lot of different species. Right. And species have arrived at different implementations of detecting that variable. So, you know, what's the what's the the best level of description for a, a general theory of perception and action? Probably the functional level. Functional level, yes. That makes sense. Perfect. Okay, which doesn't mean you don't want to understand how the locust is doing it and how the monkey is right, doing right. it, right? right? But it's maybe that's the wrong level to look for general generalizations. Yeah. No, that 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 clears the thinking, you know, like generalization versus a uh, more context specific or species specific or maybe uh, individual specific uh, investigation. And it might be that we as humans, like we, I mean, all humans are doing it differently as well. We might not have the same kind of implementation. Possibly. So, yeah. That what a nightmare. Yeah, what a nightmare to think about. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Professor Warren. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. Uh, you learned a lot uh, about your work and eco like ecological psychology and neuroscience. Uh, I thanks normally for, end you. the conversation with uh, one, you would say, again, tall question, which is, if you become the uncontested dictator of the Republic of Ecological Psychology, what would be some of the steps you would take now for the field to grow? <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I, I think go go back to the go back to your research right i mean do the research do the hard work um study the information figure out how to do the experiments that is what's going to be ultimately um persuasive i think if you can if you can get our theoretical ideas to play out experimentally right yeah. that's going to be more convincing um so just i mean it's kind of like nose to the grindstone it's like read the philosophy, understand the general principles, but then cash it out. It's really important to cash it out in terms of actual research results. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of like numero uno for me. It's like, it's it's really fun to get together and have, I mean, I love going to ICPA. I get, you know, the, this is the International Conference on Perception and Action sponsored by the International Society for Ecological right. Psychology, of which I'm the current president. Um, you know, those are really, really important meetings, but we have, and we have very high flown discussions in that, in that um, conference, you know, but then go, go home and do the research to cash it out. Right. right. Um, so the other thing is that I, I do think I, I've reluctantly come to believe that um, having a higher, a better social media presence is going to be important. Um, again, I reluctantly, you know, observe my own students and what they're watching. Right more people are watching YouTube videos than they are pulling those tomes off the library shelves, right? So that is gonna be influential in how people start at least catching people's attention and thinking about these problems. So the society's recently started a, a kind of social media committee um, led by Julia Blau that is gonna to try to promote, you know, things like your podcast or, you know, posting, you know, even a set of, Sometimes they're called sci tunes, right? Just ten minute explanations of different right. ecological principles. Rob Gray has a podcast on the applications of, you know, ecological psychology and dynamical systems to sports sciences, and that's that's kind of a booming area right now. Right. So those sorts of things are going to, you know, maybe penetrate, but they're not going to convince the scientists, yes. the other right. scientists, right? It's right. going to get us more into the eye of, of potential students, which is really important. Right. But we're also at the mercy of these fads that are going through the field. I mean, if someone is coming in who's computationally literate at this moment, they're going to be doing deep neural networks, right? They're not going to be doing, you know, our kind of our kind of experimental research, right? right. So I, I covet the skills that those people have, but you know, they're going to go get a job at you know, at Google you know, or Microsoft or whatever with, you know, doing deep learning. And we're going to be back in the lab kind of grinding away at these experimental results. But that's, you know, that's where the proof of the pudding is going to be. No, that that was wonderful. I think that was wonderful advice. Uh, and 
you very well highlight the importance of empirical investigations and uh, them as the main source of uh, convincing uh, what you can call the opponents. <laughs> So, so we need all we need all these groups, right? I mean, we need all these people working at 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 multiple levels, right? De definitely, and and definitely, we we as practicing researchers also have to grow in our scope that we can absorb some of that talent. For instance, we have to be open to the idea of having projects which include deep learning, for instance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Although, be careful, right? I mean, it's it's a don't get captured by, um, you know the, you know the philosophy of that approach. Um, you can use it as a tool. Right, of course, of course. I mean, we have to stick to our uh, our ontology. I mean, yeah. that's that's the fundamental. So, uh, thank you, Professor Warren, uh, for coming to the show. Uh, it was really lovely, and we hope that uh, we might have you at some later point with more updates and a deeper discussion. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Madhur. I really uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Professor. Have a great day ahead. Take care. Bye bye.